Thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> um, I don't know how many people are here or how many people are watching and what time zones you're in, but um, here in the uh, UK, it's quarter past nine in the morning. So it's quarter past time, quarter past 10 in uh, most of Western Europe and uh, somewhat later probably in Australia. Um, in a few moments, I'm hoping that I'm going to be talking with uh, Richard Moyes, who is the Managing Director of Article 36. Now, Article 36 is a non-profit organisation focused on um, <clears throat> reducing the harm that um, weapons cause. And uh, one of the campaigns, as I understand it, that uh, Article 36 is currently helping to coordinate um, is the campaign against killer robots. And so today, Richard Moyes, and I'm not sure if he's with us yet. I, yeah, I don't he is. Know. Richard, hello to you. Thanks very much for joining us. And I hope yeah. I'm not misrepresenting uh, you or Article 36 in the few so comments. Far, you're on track. Um, <clears throat> autonomous weapons are um, of various categories or involving various categories of um, human intervention or human control are, um, for good or ill, part of modern um, arsenals. And I su <clears throat> suspect it would be uncontroversial to say that um, the, de the degree of autonomy and the um, use to which these weapons are going to be put is likely to increase in the future and may indeed become, um, to use the tagline of this um, event, um, the new normal. I think one of the points you're going to be um, addressing today, Richard, is um, uh, the intersection of, of that um, issue and law, and particularly international law and humanitarian law. So um, with the uh, title of your talk here, Killing People in the Future, Autonomous Weapons and the Law, I'll hand over to you. Um, but before I do, just repeat this last um, provocative question that um, I see in some of the blurb here, which is this, can machines uh, do the killing better for us. Richard Moyes, over to you. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, hi everybody. Very uh, nice to be able to very nice to be able to join you. Um, as Andrew said, I'm Richard Moyes from Article Thirty Six, which is a small non-governmental organisation uh, based in the UK, but really working uh, internationally. Uh, and we're part of the campaign to stop killer robots, but. More broadly, we, we specialize in issues of law and policy development around, around weapons. And uh, my working background, personally, I, I started working really in humanitarian operations related to landmine clearance and explosive ordnance uh, disposal. And then over the last 15 years or so, I've worked much more on the development of legal, international legal instruments and international policy instruments. So I worked on the development of the Convention on Cluster Munitions, which is a treaty prohibition on, on cluster bombs and more recently on the development of the Treaty uh, on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And I've worked on a number of policy related instruments as well, political policy instruments like the Safe Schools Declaration and other, and other initiatives. So this is all to say that the framing, the, the, the position from which I'm coming to this uh, subject matter is, is, is really one of thinking about how we as an international community, um, obviously with states in a primary position as those entities that can make international law, how do we work together strategically to, to frame problems, uh, to frame issues, and then to develop um, effective legal uh, responses to those, uh, to those issues? Effective legal responses often in terms of shaping the normative uh, framework within which we're operating. So sort of shaping what our expectations of good behavior are or, or our assumptions of bad behavior are in a, in a sort of wider international society. So, we're interested in weapons, which are a technology that we use to, to kill each other. They're a sort of form of negative health technology in a way, and that they're designed to affect health, just not in a, in a positive uh, way. And it's, there's a whole area of international sort of rules, uh, norms and expectations around this, uh, treaty law, as well as, as well as the sort of general rules of international humanitarian law in armed conflict, and of course, human rights law considerations uh, as well. And I think in terms of approaching this issues around autonomy, we can also see these technologies as being part of the, some of the tools by which we 
construct our relationships with each other, both as individuals, but also in the relationships between states and other and other sort of uh, groups and configurations. So in, in violence and in the tools we choose for violence, there's also a sort of uh, an articulation of a certain type of, of relations, um, relations between us. The issue of autonomy in weapon systems, killer robots as we frame it to kind of to drive attention, but I mean, it's also technically correct. They are, we are talking about systems that are fall under the definition of robots and have the sort of power to apply force in some way. Um, lethal autonomous weapons are under discussion at the United Nations. They have been for the last um, eight years or so at the Convention on Conventional Weapons in, in Geneva. So this is a, a live area of international deliberation about uh, rulemaking and, and norm setting. So I thought what I'd do is I'd sketch out how we see, what we see as a problem in this area, and then talk a little bit about the, the political dynamics of it in terms of the negotiations, and finally sort of close up with the, the sort of formulations we as a sort of civil society body think are appropriate in response to this, um, these technological uh, developments. Starting with the problem, I think is always reasonable. Of course, one of our roles as NGOs um, is to construct and to frame problems. I think it took me a little bit by surprise in my working life when I came to realize that actually I spend more time or as much time on creating problems as I do on, on articulating the solutions to them. But how problems are formulated and how they're framed, of course, um, is intricate, uh, intimately linked to uh, the sort of solutions that are, that are available to you. So in terms of thinking about rulemaking in the future and thinking about how we all organize strategically to achieve certain ends, the process of, of problem formulation is, is very significant. When we talk about aut autonomous weapons or autonomy and weapon systems, we're really talking about uh, weapon systems which use sensors to determine specifically when, where, and against what force is going to be, force is going to be applied. So for a human commander who is firing a more conventional weapon, they may be specifying uh, the specific geographical location where they would like a bomb to land or a shell to land, or they might be uh, tagging a particular object which they want the, the weapon system to follow and to strike. But with systems that have autonomy, they're essentially putting the system uh, into effect, into use in, a, in an area of some description. It can be smaller, it can be larger. And within that area, and for a certain period of time, there's a reliance on a, on a sensor system to identify what the target is going to, uh, what is going to be identified as a, as a target. So this creates a number of issues. One is that there is this um, uncertainty about specifically when and where force will occur. And therefore there's some uncertainty about uh, what the side effects of that, uh, of that will actually be. Um, these can be managed to some extent, but there's a degree of uncertainty in, in that. And there's also a challenge because having sensors identify what they're going to apply force to also requires us to, to encode the target in some way. We have to program into that system, whether that's in a computer code or in, even in a simple mechanical structure, but we have to encode some sort of representation of what is going to be considered a target. And of course, what is a target, what's a legitimate target in, in armed conflict is dependent upon a number of contextual tests. It's not something that just exists permanently and can be encoded permanently in some form. It can only be encoded as a sort of temporary representation or a temporary approximation that is going to be taken to be sufficient in certain, in certain circumstances. So there are tensions that come from a sort of predictability uh, framework around specifically when and where force, force will occur. But there's also tensions that arise from a, a sort of morality, uh, as a morality considerations about how a target can be uh, legitimately encoded uh, into, the, into the operation of a, of a system. For us, this uh, in a way raises dangers in relation to a sort of range of values that I think we feel as a coalition or as an organization, we, we would feel that we adhere to. It threatens a sort of dehumanization if you're reducing people, for example, if you're targeting people based on some sense of representation of them then you're effectively just reducing that person and their personhood to a set of uh, data points and deciding that that's sufficient to, to kill them or to, to harm them. I feel that there's a sort of digital dehumanization process at work in that. Um, 
there are risks of undermining the law because of the way that the law is structured around individual attacks and around contextual decisions needing to be made by humans. The law, of course, only is applied, applies to humans. It's directed at humans. So it's humans who have to make legal decisions. But if the decisions they're making are then about systems that operate over wider and wider areas, over longer and longer periods of time, then the level of granularity of the human decision making to the actual contextual circumstances in which force will occur becomes um, become somewhat eroded and and you end up with a sort of loosening of the legal of the legal fabric in in many respects we also have concerns about opaque technologies i think we recognize that with ai in its various manifestations and data sets as a basis for for constructing um uh, com you know computer system functioning machine learning as a process of object recognition and identification it's quite common these days to have machine systems where the user can't really unpick how the how the system is coming to the determinations that it is that it is making. So in the case of machine learning, you may know how it has learned and you may know that it will the system will likely recognize dogs rather than cats in 95 percent of circumstances. But we don't actually know what it is identifying. And that means we don't know what the error states will be. So. We have concerns about the explicability of technology in these areas as well and how that bears upon a human uh, commander's ability to make um, legal decisions. And beyond this, these are sort of predictability, sort of proximate predictability and morality related concerns. But beyond this, there's anxieties about the, the potential risks to peace and security. Um, there is no doubt that this is an issue that is a dynamic of tension between um, the US and China and other major military powers. This is an area where those powers see, I think, the potential to try to further embed and maintain their military hegemony, essentially. And so there is risks of a, of a sort of arms race orientation in this area, as well as risks that come from technological structures more and more interacting with each other and creating uncertainties and risks about what will, what will actually occur and the, the danger of sort of false alarms escalating into... Um, into into conflict. So there's a sort of range of sort of perhaps value-based and security-based, legally-based uh, concerns in this area. In the political domain, like I said, it's a discussion, it's an issue of discussion at the Convention on Conventional Weapons. That's a forum that meets regularly in Geneva. It can create new international law in the form of uh, new protocols that it can adopt under its framework. It's a kind of framework convention. The problem with the Convention on Conventional Weapons is that it's, um, it operates on an understanding of consensus that means that pretty much everybody has a, um, a potential veto over, over decisions that get made. And that means a potential veto over the agenda before you even get to any kind of outcome document. So it's a very slow moving structure and it hasn't adopted a new protocol since 2003. So it's it's not as if it uh, produces new law at a, at a rate of knots. Um, within that framework, currently, there'll be a meeting um, in two weeks' time, which will be deciding the way forward for discussions on this issue. There is currently what's called a group of governmental experts, which means a sort of deliberating body made up of all of the, the parties to the meeting, basically, deciding on a way forward. We've been trying to persuade them to move into the negotiation of a new legal instrument, but currently, uh, the major military powers, as they certainly style themselves, Russia, the US, uh, the UK and, and uh, China and others are not in favor of moving to moving to negotiations. So there's a there's a sort of basically slow, drawn out process there. On the other hand, there are some 30 more countries who have uh, spoken in favor of a legal instrument. Um, many of them are countries, I'd say, in the global south. And I think it resonates for them with a sense that this issue is one of primarily of northern uh, military powers maintaining technologies that they think will give them an advantage and that that's going to be a disadvantage to countries in the south who are more likely to be on the receiving end of the technologies in terms of receiving of the force. Um, so there's a bit of a political dynamic there. European states tend to be sort of in the middle, but in a relatively unhelpful uh, mode, more or less uh, so far being comfortable to go along with the let's not create new law um, orientation. Just in sort of wrapping up, I mean, I think that uh, 
from our perspective, new law in this area is possible, but it's definitely challenging to make law about future technologies and about um, you know most of the new legal most of the legal instruments that have been developed in relation to weapon technologies have been responsive to patterns of harm that have been extant on the ground. So anti-personnel landmines were prohibited based on a recognition that there was a substantial ongoing pattern of harm internationally. Cluster munitions also, that prohibition was developed on the basis of sort of evidence of harm being marshaled. So it gets rather more difficult for our community as NGOs that when there is not the straightforward external um, referent of, of, of harm to draw upon. Um, it also means the, the sort of legal orientation that needs to be taken needs to be rather more open and principle based. It needs to have some flexibility to it, to my mind, because it's going to need to cater to different technical manifestations in the, um, in the future. And those are somewhat, um, of course, those are somewhat uh, uncertain. But to our mind, we think that the issue can be dealt with through, well, three key, um, three key elements, really. One is we would like to see certain prohibitions, and there would be prohibitions on systems that target people uh, across the board, uh, very much in the same way as the prohibition on anti-personnel landmines prohibits uh, the use of a system that has a sensor and uh, is intended to target people. I think we would just, I would extend that principle um, generally to prohibit the targeting of people. Partly this is because not, this is not necessarily an orientation that is uh, demanded by existing law, but rather I think responds to moral and ethical concerns in the technology, but also responds to the, the sort of more practical concerns that if you start to try to divide up people and say, our weapon system will only target um, active combatants, then you have to start to identify those people in a way that I think is going to be ultimately unconvincing. Currently, we don't really have systems that use sensors to target people automatically without any human uh, intervention. And so I think that drawing that line now would be sensible. A second prohibition would be on systems that can't be effectively explained or that uh, are changeable in their, in their mode of functioning. I think the concept of explicability broadly captures it. I think it'd be a prohibition, it could be a positive uh, obligation not to develop systems that are not explicable in certain in certain ways, but I think the concept of explicability and systems that can be effectively understood by the user is, is important in this space. And finally, I think we would, we would look to um, ensure that there are positive obligations on systems that are not prohibited. So those systems that are not sort of outlawed, there needs to be some obligations to control where they're used, like the spatial area within which they're used and the duration for which they can be used. Uh, in a way that allows the commander to meet their existing legal legal obligations. Now, I don't think that time and space can be fixed to a number, but I think there needs to be some recognition that a commander has to control time and space of a system's <laughs> functioning in order to in order to apply the legal and the legal rules. There is a growing sort of dynamic, I think, towards that posture. Um, bodies like the International Committee of the Red Cross, and I think a number of states now are starting to see a response to this issue within that same within that same sort of structure i don't think we'll be able to get a legal instrument uh, within the convention on conventional weapons because of the way that it works um, but the most likely route to, to an outcome on this issue i think is is going to be in the same manner that we've seen on the treaty on anti-personnel mines and the treaty on cluster munitions which is that after talks in the convention on conventional weapons um, fail to come to an outcome after say eight years, uh, a group of states decide that they would like to develop a legal instrument on this issue separately, and they convene a separate track of discussions to that effect. In my mind, I don't think that's likely to happen before 2022, beginning of 2022. That's more or less the strategic um, landscape that I'm operating against. I guess finally, I should come back to the question of can machines do the killing for us better? Um, this is an area where, of course, techno-optimism and the idea that machines can just make better decisions than, than humans is, is often asserted by um, the proponents of, of technologies. And of course, machines in certain narrow contexts can make better decisions than, than humans. They're better at chess, for example, than us. But conflict isn't chess. Uh, conflict is a messy business, and it's generally expressive or evocative of a breakdown of human relations in some way that we have to turn to violence. I don't think in that context that violence can be cleaned up 
and that we can hand over to machines some ability to just implement violence for us in some more idealized, uh, rationalized uh, way. Uh, for me, this you know, still involves applying labels to things and asserting that those labels and those representations are a sufficient basis for applying force or for harming uh, somebody or something. And with a sort of historical mindset, I kind of feel that the, the history of states deciding that their ability to label things and apply force to them is not a positive one. I think it would be hubris for us in our society to think that we are now at a point where we can just uh, assign the labels for, for who gets killed and who doesn't get killed and expect those processes to work um, unproblematically. So I feel that uh, there's a messiness in violence and conflict that ultimately we shouldn't think we're trying to remove because maybe the messiness is also part of the impetus to avoid conflict in the in the first place. Um, yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. And I guess if there's questions or you know on this issue or on the wider issues of how sort of lawmaking in this area of weapons works, in my experience, then um, then pleased to engage with people. Thanks, Andy. Richard. Thank you very much for that. Can, can I um? just asked you for a couple of points. Firstly, um, just to um, seek some clarification. Um, when you were talking about prohibitions, the first prohibition you mentioned was um, <clears throat> uh, automated weapon systems that can target people. And when you say people, you're lumping together, as it were, combatants or alleged combatants and non-combatants, are you? Yeah. And I mean, I, and of course, people could people could assert that we should split the we should split between the two. Um, but for various reasons, I think it's better to draw a blanket line in that area. But yes, I'm I'm lumping them together. And, and so, d does that um, position necessarily involve that you would be um, uh, against the use, for example, of drones? albeit drones which are under some level of um, in-the-loop human um, control? I, I would definitely draw a, a distinction, and I mean, this is an important distinction for the technologies in question here, which perhaps, I, I, again, I, I wasn't clear enough on. The, the key thing for me is this, we're talking about systems where sensors identify the target and force is applied automatically without any human uh, evaluation of that. This, so this current arms, current arms of, drones. Sorry. So I was saying this is sometimes called out of human out of the loop yeah. weaponry. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I mean, there are some other terms around human on the loop and the like. But in my mind, to my mind, if, if a sensor detects uh, an object and from that there is, a, there is a process of automatically applying force, then that's the, the boundary threshold within which we're operating here. And so any system that identifies people as people in that in that sort of mode. Um, now, how you identify people, of course, can be done in many ways. An anti-personnel mine is identifying people just on the basis of weight over five kilograms equals a person. It's a very crude um, representation of, of people, but but anything that I that is intended to uh, identify people in that mode, uh, I would suggest subject to prohibition. Now, um, obviously the, the technology is still developing and I suspect given the, 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 um, the exponential um, increase in, in technology and it, that in 10 years time we'll be in a very different position from where we are today in terms of what machines can identify, how reliable their identification process is, et cetera. Just by way of um, slight analogy, consider where we were ten years ago with regards to driverless cars and where we are now. Um, and there's a, if I can, there's a slightly sort of another sort of slightly interesting analogy here that part of the thinking, at least among some group of people, when they were considering the question of driverless cars, was accident most. Um, car accidents involved human error. And so the idea was take the human out of the equation and you reduce the errors and you reduce the accidents. I don't think I'm defending this, but 
there is an argument in respect of um, autonomous weapons, which says, well, look, if you look at um, various of the, or generally the, the, the atrocities that, that are committed in war, they're usually a result of either bad intention or mistake. Take, take the case of you know, the, the, the bombing of a Red Cross hospital or, or, or similar. Now, if the technology could reduce the, the scope for error, and if the technology doesn't have bad intent, um, th there is a case, some people say, to be made for um, promoting this form of um, autonomous weaponry. Yeah, well, for a start, of course, they're not cars, right? Because cars aren't intended to kill people. So the, the moral questions involved in terms of ruling out uh, mistakes and uh, and perhaps streamlining operation are, are somewhat uh, different. I mean, in any context, the law applies to humans and it's humans who have to use the, the system. So there's within the structure of the law, there are limitations to how far any kind of legal determination can be handled. Well, legal determinations can't be handed over to machines to implement. The legal determinations and the choices about weapons use need to be made by humans under the law that it, as it exists. And then they need to be employing the machine systems uh, subsequent to, to that. So, so I don't think that um, one can really realistically envisage a situation where human intent is removed from the process, uh, like the potential for bad intent is removed from the process because the human intent is always still there in the use of the system. Sure, but, the but, system. Sure, but, but I mean, a, a robot doesn't decide to rape. A robot doesn't decide to torture. Yeah, well, a, robot, we, a robot hopefully wouldn't have a sadistic mentality. Yeah, and this is, I think, where again it it comes back to a sense of how the technologies then uh, relate to our understanding of ourselves, right? Because humans don't have to decide to rape, and humans don't have to decide to torture people, and we need to ensure that we're constructing a society in which humans don't rape people and humans don't torture people not thinking that we hand over the killing to machines, because if we don't hand it over to machines, we'll just kill people and rape them and torture them as humans, because that's who we are. So I think that the, the co-construction in that sort of model of what it means to be human and where we think uh, machines function, I think is wildly negative actually for, for our sort of view of future, future society. And I think that, yeah, in that kind of mode, the sort of, the techno optimism is also too embracing of a of a sort of pessimism about people when ultimately people are still going to be there behind this technology and if we think so lowly of ourselves in this mode then i think our basis for confidence that we're going to program build and then operate these technologies without these negative underpinnings being manifest through them i think is um i think is probably uh, erroneous but um and before I ask um, uh, other listeners and viewers to um, uh, to join the conversation and ask questions of you, <clears throat> just help me a little bit, if you would, on the question of um, ultimate accountability, which seems to be um, a, a major issue in the debate about autonomous weapons. Um, and why it isn't a sufficient answer, for example, to say, well, look, when things go wrong, we can have a system of, say, no fault liability so that people will be compensated for what's gone wrong. Um, it won't be that they will be without any form of redress. Why isn't um, it, it, that, um, why doesn't that sufficiently address the question of accountability? Well, I mean, we don't have that system, right? So, um, so in international law, in international law at present, in the way that conflict is conducted, there is no sort of straightforward sort of legal structures by which the victims of uh, wrongs or of mistakes uh, get some mandated uh, assistance or compensation or or whatever. So I think one of the one of the challenges here is is that the the separation potentially of humans from uh, Full information about decisions that are being made or, or outcomes that are occurring um, creates a 
a tension between genuine responsibility and accountability as it can be applied. So a human who uses a system, um, you could assert within a military chain of command that that person's accountable for, for what happens in the use of that system. And that's just a management function, right? Um, something goes wrong, that person's held accountable and gets punished for it. But if they're operating in within a wider systemic structure that has authorized the use of a system where uh, we're saying you're accountable, but actually you can't personally fully take responsibility for it because you can't actually understand how it works and you can't actually evaluate the context in which it's going to use sufficient, uh, be used sufficiently to understand what's going to happen. You, it feels like you get a tension between the potential of that person to be actually um, responsible morally and the way that the accountability structure is bearing down on them. In other areas, I'm less um, anxious about accountability issues. And I mean, I, I feel like if we're just talking about um, machines, tools, uh, technologies, then I think we have to recognize that if a technology goes wrong, it's just the same as if a current um, bomb goes off target, a technology goes wrong and the you know you have to determine where that technical fault came from and apply the you know apply the responsibilities according to that so part of me feels like the difference is sometimes the different the, the anxieties about accountability in this space come from over investing mentally the technology with sort of human legal decision making powers i don't adopt that posture so i think there's a more mundane process of Partly it's just, it's just like any other technology, technical mistakes or faults need to be addressed in the same way. But more generally, I feel like the, the question is, does the accountability of the user and the responsibility of the user, like in a moral sense, actually ma match up? Like, I, I, th I think I can appreciate that. But can, can I just ask you this? Um, if we go back to the question of um, the, the use of armed drones, for example, I mean, over the last however many years, we have seen countless examples of wedding parties and the like being blown up by drones because someone sitting in a bunker, whether it's in Nevada or in Europe, has made the wrong decision, let us hope, rather than deliberately, accidentally made the wrong decision rather than deliberately. In terms of accountability, I mean, how often does it happen that the the drone operator who's just blown up another wedding party uh, actually um, has to answer for this, for what's happened? Yeah, I um, I don't actually know, but I, I, suspect, that I suspect that it's very, very rarely. And I suspect that um, oftentimes the analysis of the instrument, uh, of the incident still constructs a concept of what happened that validates the choices that were made on the basis of the information available, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, then the, the ill intent wasn't there and it was just a sort of systemic product of uh, uncertainties and errors of evaluation mounting up into it. So, so yeah, I mean, I think the, this, this is a significant issue in the world in general. The, I mean, I think the use of armed drones raises various concerns about the law, the role of the, the rule of law, the way in which law is applied, the way in which legal terms are, are bent and reshaped in order to actually enable the use of the technology rather than serving to constrain the use of the technology, which in many cases, I think the law as written would, would normally have, have done. So I think it's an example again of where we see the technology shaping the way that legal interpretations are undertaken because the will to use the technology is more powerful than the words on the on the page and i think that that, that sort of dynamic has existed with respect to armed drones and i think we would see still more of that in relation to the the expansion of autonomy elsewhere that uh, it starts to pull people into thinking well can we just interpret the law slightly differently to allow us to do uh, to do this and uh, I think that's a dangerous pull for technology in relation to, to law. Well, th there's many more questions I'd like to ask you, but I don't want to uh, monopolize this um, event. So um, do we have any um, people who are in a position to unmute their mics and um, ask uh, Richard a question? Mm. 
Not so far. I think we might be getting to the point of handing over to the next session, are we as well? What time is the, uh, the handover point? Let's see what it is. You have 10 minutes left to go. A message has just come up on my screen. All right. well, let me, if I may, then um, um, ask you another question, um, Richard. And um, I should make it <laughs> clear, in case it isn't already, that um, the fact that I ask these questions doesn't mean that I have sympathy with uh, the uh, ideological or political position which um, may seem to inform them. But... Um, <clears throat> This question, I'd like to go back to the question of technology. If um, an autonomous system is better at identifying wedding parties than a human, should we, um, be in, should we not be in favor of um, a weapon system which um, in the words of a uh, someone at the, when I was looking at earlier, the Georgia Institute of Technology says, is, is making war more humane? Yeah. This... Um, well, I mean, I think uh, in terms of how such a system can, th there, are, there are significant risks involved in handing over to machines the idea that the machine is responsible for evaluating civilian risks rather than people. So, if you have a technology, I mean, and I'm not wanting to too much buy into a particular uh, example concept, which, you know, these things are often uh, is entirely hypothetical. But uh, if you had a technology that is capable of identifying um, uh, in that, in your example, a wedding party and therefore cancelling a strike, say, because it has identified something as such, then I think it's difficult to object to the employment of that technology to cancel force from occurring. On the other hand, I think the user of the system should also be under an obligation to fully evaluate the civilian risk themselves and not to operate on the assumption that such a system will identify uh, additional civilian risks for them. Because the, the danger of such a dynamic is that the human operator then just, just becomes totally reliant upon uh, a system for identifying any harm to civilians and of course civilians enjoy general protection not just when they're undertaking wedding parties and therefore are in this hypothetical example capable of being identified in some structured way so we need to resist the idea that we can divide up the civilian world into readily identifiable things because that suits machines and then hand over to the machines the identifiable the identification of those things so the upshot is that I think the human operator still needs to take full responsibility for the identification of civilian risks. And in their use of the system, they shouldn't assume that this, this subroutine will function to identify um, any such civilian uh, uh, congregations, say. But that in that framework, the idea of a system that restrains from or, or prevents the application of force, I think is uh, theoretically difficult for me to object to. So, so I think the key thing there is the establishment of the prior rule about full uh, uh, assessment of civilian harm for the human and what their presumptions about system functioning should be. Because as, <clears throat> as I understand it, the, 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 the sort of the focus of concern here is those systems where the human is out of the loop. And so it's just down to the machine to make the decision to fire or not, or to bomb or not. Yeah, um, that's true. But still, in any case, the sy systems in this area are being used within a particular area of time and space by a person. So it's not like uh, the per a, a human operator still establishes the context within which the sy this system will function. I mean, that's the same for existing systems that we have now, where we have ship mounted missile defense systems uh, an operator turns them on they're evaluating an area of the sky for a period of time until a human operator turns them off again in that context the, the, the human operator controls what area of the sky they're functioning within or what's their sort of area of functioning and they control the duration of that functioning that, and that, controlling that allows them to evaluate and to determine whether the encoding of a target that the system uses is a reasonable representation of a target 
within that contextual space and, and time. That's but when, but just take taking that example, <clears throat> the, assume the um, the system mounted on the ship um, tells the the human that it's identified a threat, and I don't know how these systems work, but but just bear with me. Assume that the 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 computer says, look, the following boxes have been ticked, which leads me, the computer, decide, to decide it's 99% certain that this is an incoming missile. Does the, uh, the, the human operator's um, ability, as it were, to um, intellectually override that decision must be very, very limited indeed, and particularly- yeah, but, in, it, but, but in this case, I don't have a problem with that because as, as long as the human is controlling the time and uh, and space of system functioning in a way where they can evaluate that that the system's operation is appropriate then I mean in existing systems then the human operator doesn't have doesn't over doesn't override it in that situation you don't have don't have time and incoming missiles come in too quickly the system will identify the radar signature of the incoming missile and will shoot it will shoot it down and as far as my tests of, of whether this is acceptable or not go it's not an anti-personnel system it's shooting down things that are identified to be missiles or proxies for missiles. It's understandable to the operator because the operator knows that it's going to respond to radar signatures on a particular bearing and a particular velocity. And that's how the system functions. And the human operator controls the time and the, you know, the duration and the spatial area of functioning. So, so in that situation, I think that's a system that's it's using autonomy, but it's, but, uh, but it's being operated with a sufficient degree of of human control. That doesn't mean that mistakes can't arise. I mean, with those same systems, airliners have been shot down, so things can things can go wrong with those systems. But I think that fundamentally, you know, that mode of operation can be can be managed within you know within the existing legal framework effectively, um, subject to certain uh, obligations regarding the the human control over duration and and spatial uh, spatial area. The concern for me is, is similar systems, which uh, currently they, they, you know, they have an anti-armor systems where warheads float over an area for a period of time, seeking certain heat shapes of armored vehicles. When they identify that heat shape, they detonate and attack the armored vehicles. Now, in current systems, these may cover only a very small area of ground and operate for a very short period of time, like 10 seconds. In the future, you could easily expand that capacity over a wider area and over a longer period of time. And in doing so, the, the human commander's decision about what's likely to occur and what the likely risks are becomes more and more based on sort of general assumptions rather than on any kind of actual contextually specific uh, sort of information about, uh, about the, the, the system of the, the area of operation. So, so I think one of the key things is that we have systems already that operate with a degree of autonomy in terms of sensors identifying targets and applying force to them. But we need to keep them within a sufficiently constrained area of space and time. Otherwise, the human decision making about those si systems gets too gets too abstract and too uh, too strained. Essentially, mm. um, if no one is um, going to butt in, can I ask you another question, Richard? A slightly different uh, uh, subject matter. But um, one of the um, objections that I've uh, seen raised. Um, is, frequently in respect of these automated systems is the potential for their use by governments against their own people, um, avoiding the risk, as it were, of um, a human uh, security service uh, person deciding not to fire on his own people. Robots probably don't recognize um, people as being their own or not. Um, is that a, a matter which is that your um, organization has looked at or has a, a position on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that we tend to be more um, conflict orientated than um, than like domestic policing and law enforcement. So uh, and that has risks because it means that our primary sort of uh, mode of legal thinking tends to be international humanitarian law, which is, of course, more permissive of killing and harming people than uh, human rights law is. So I think we, from my perspective, I am wary that um, rules that are shaped 
with a specific focus on armed conflict may not be sufficient uh, to situations of uh, where human rights law is is prevalent. So um, when I say armed conflict, I mean conduct of hostilities in armed conflict. So um, so yes, there are there is a potential for for a tension between the applicable standards in this area. Um, I haven't really seen, it feels to me like the technological drive uh, is more dynamic in the conflict terrain than it is in the law enforcement uh, terrain. I think there are lots of ways in which new technologies and data management and AI are bearing and you know bringing automation to bear potentially problematically in law enforcement. But I think currently in the sort of zone of weaponization, it's more in an armed conflict mode and it's it's delivering force in a mode that's more appropriate to armed conflict, like with explosive force or, or the like, uh, than it is in a, a sort of policing policing mode at, at present. But certainly uh, it would be an area to be concerned about. Yeah. No, I, no, I understand what you say. Um, I was reading an article um, yesterday, I think, which talked about, um, I think I think the expression it used was the the fusion of law of uh, war and policing, uh, and was contemplating the the um, scenario, the position in the near future, where um, particularly from a sort of surveillance point of view, you have um, uh, a state has all this, uh, whether whether it be a foreign state or, or not, has all this technology at its um, fingertips, which it can use to um, police uh, and survey areas. Um, may, it may not um, be uh, <laughs> bombing people with drones um, all the time, but instead it is controlling an area and controlling a people or perhaps people who are judged to be somehow insurgents or whatever, um, and using that technology to have a um, massive amount of control over what goes on in that zone. Um, do you see that as, a, I, I, I accept that's not warfare as such, but do you see, um, or what, what's your reaction to this idea of the fusion as it were, technology f helping to fuse yeah. war and policing? Well, I certainly think we need to work to maintain a clear separation of policing from the military. I mean, we see in America, uh, there's a sort of militarization of the police, which is partly driven by the handing over of technologies, right? So the, the way in which technologies are, are used is also part of the construction and, and um, sort of mental uh, uh, landscape development of, of who people think they are and how they conceptualize their roles. So I think the handing over of military equipment to police pulls the two closer together. Uh, for us, we work on issues around the use of explosive weapons in particular. So um, in, in a different context to this, but maintaining a sense that explosive force is, is not for use in law enforcement and policing, uh, but is only potentially uh, reasonable in the, in the context of armed conflict, I think is useful as well. I think maintaining some sense of normative exclusion of certain technologies and modes of force from policing into conflict is, uh, is certainly an agenda we should be mindful of, some of which is not uh, demanded by existing law, but rather is just there in practice and needs to be reinforced if, if we can. Richard Moyes, it's been fascinating um, talking uh, with you and listening to you. Um, I'm being told that we have run out of time and that I have to um, shut up and <laughs> leave the stage for someone else. Um, I'd love to continue this discussion another time. Thanks very, very much for joining us. It's been fascinating. Very educated. Bye. Bye-bye, Richard.